I'm really not sure. Okay, maybe I am sure. <coughs> but... I looked at the devotional today, and of course it's my utmost. And it discusses a topic that some people would love to comment on and talk about and discuss. For me, it's probably a, I feel sorrow, I guess, would be the best word to describe it. I feel kind of Besides cold, I feel kind of remorse over some of the things that I saw and some of the things that I experienced that maybe you haven't and maybe you don't know. You know, I, I grew up with Keith Green. You know, I, I was a baby Christian at the time that Keith Green was around, so it was great. It was magnificent. It was wonderful. You know, he had a passion and a desire to challenge the status quo of accepting what we were seeing as commercialization of Christianity. He didn't want that to happen. You know, he, he wanted this zeal and this fire to be always for God alone and not for other things and distractions of the world and in the world. And I don't know completely if he was like in person, because I didn't go to his study or study with him or talk to him, but I was to as many of his concerts, like many Christians, caught up with the whole idea of throwing away our, at that time, Christian bumper stickers and living our life to let our witness be our lives and let our words be always devoted towards manifesting Jesus in all of our life. You know, to, reject the world to accept, you know, the call to follow Jesus and to be his disciple. Like many of my peers who have gone on to become ministers and pastors, Greg Laurie, Mike McIntosh, um, Malcolm Wild, um, <laughs> Chuck Missler, you know, just all these men of God that I was fortunate to be in that environment with all these men at the same time, in the same place. It was like a, a fire that wouldn't go out, you know. We had the best of the best, the creme of the creme. You know, it was the Jesus movement. It was Jesus fruits. When we chose to give God our lives, each one of us dealt with giving up a lot of what we had. We chose not to go and be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God in Christ Jesus for ourselves personally, so that we would go out and demonstrate to the world that we were a generation that was different, that we were not of the world, but we were destined for off world, out of this world, something beyond what people could see, touch and feel, but that we knew Jesus and he was coming again soon, and he is coming very soon. In a lot of ways, it's very sad for me to say, maybe today the message isn't the same. Maybe we haven't communicated accurately the cost of Christianity, the discipleship that should be occurring within those people who are content to sit on their lives and make their soul secure within their own community and their comfort zone. To be only doing minusculely those things that don't cost much, that doesn't involve much self-sacrifice, that they can fit it into their schedule. Sunday, maybe on a night or a Wednesday. But we have to take care of our children. We have to do these other things too. We have to have our jobs. And I think of all the people that I know that personally, personally gave up their job to follow Jesus, gave up their life 
their life, their love, their destiny, their future, their hope, and their calling in order to walk with God. Maybe I shouldn't record this video. And maybe I shouldn't read this devotion. Because I know those men of God that have died in my generation to be missionaries. Me, Elias, yeah, heard the call and went out to a people who did not know Jesus, who so gave up promising careers to walk with God, who so decided it wasn't God giving them the ability to play football, baseball, and to be famous on television and to be a witness when it came time for the cameras to be around, when it was time to broadcast it on YouTube. But in the backwaters and alleys, dying for the sake of those who were crying out in need, desperate for someone to hear and to see that they needed Jesus, that the gospel mission was to reach out to all those who were in desperate need in other lands and other places, and not just in the backwaters and the alleys and the gutters, and the places no Christian wants to go. Do we still have those men of God today? Yes, we do. For there are faithful men and women who have that hunger and desire to share Jesus with those who are destitute and in need, who are in prison, who have failed. And they go, and they do, and they participate, and they are a part of a ministry that reaches out with the love of God that is inside of them to touch the lives and the hearts and the minds of some people so that they too would enter into the kingdom of God and find salvation for their souls and hope for the future, that they would be welcomed into the kingdom of God and not enter into that lake of fire that God has reserved for the devil and all his angels. But I question, have we dared to do all that God asks us to? Is there a cost? Are we giving all of our life to him? Have you made Jesus Lord of your life? Is Jesus Lord of all or just your savior? Some people say that I'm whole hog or nothing, that I've become famous for always talking about Jesus, that I'm the most boring person in the world because every time that I want to be around people, you know, you know, I kind of don't, not really interested in what they have to say. You know, they, they have a football agenda. They know the teams, they know the scores, they know this, they know that. They can talk tech, they can talk politics, they can talk about every other thing, but they cannot talk about God. They do not know their Bible, they do not know Jesus in a personal way, they have not heard God speak, and why not? Why? What more could God say than, my sheep hear my voice and they know me? I will command himself with them. I will be known personally and intimately. Why are we settling for less? Why aren't we doing more? Why have we forsaken the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but taken all these things and added them unto us? Why? The absoluteness of Jesus Christ. He shall glorify me. The pietistic movement of today have none of the rugged reality of the New Testament about them. There is nothing about them that needs the death of Jesus Christ. All that is required is a pious, godly atmosphere and prayer and devotion and of course, let's add worship and guitars and the drums, and the sound system, and the overhead projector with the words set up there so we can read them and sing them without having to know them. 
This type of experience is not supernatural nor miraculous. It is questionable whether it is worshipping in spirit and in truth. But it is something. It did not cost the passion of God. It is not dyed in the blood of the Lamb. It has not been stamped with the hallmark of the Holy Ghost. And it has not the mark on it which makes men say as they look with awe and wonder, this is the work of God Almighty. Those people love the Lord. They love each other. They have the glory of God about them. That and nothing else is what the New Testament talks about. The type of Christian experience in the New Testament is that of a personal, passionate devotion to the person of Jesus Christ in reality, not in idealism, not in emotionalism, but in the personage of him as he speaks, as he reveals himself to them. Every other type of Christian experience, so-called, is detached from the person and the reality of Jesus himself. There is no regeneration, no being born again into the kingdom of God, which Christ lives, but only the idea that he is our pattern, the person we are to imitate, the one we are to follow as though from a distance and some idealistic concept that we can make ourselves look like, feel like, act like. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is Savior long before he is a pattern. Today he is being dispatched as the figurehead of a religion, a mere example. He is that, true, but he is infinitely more. For he is salvation itself, he is the gospel of God, he it is that John, 1 John said that if any man be in Christ, that he is a new creation, all things are passed away, behold all things are coming up. But he, 1 John, he said that he that hath the Son has life, and he hath not the Son of God has not life, and it's not having him in your head, it's having him in your heart, and your soul, and your mind, and your being. It's being filled with Jesus himself possessed by the Holy Spirit, obsessed with the knowledge of knowing him in a more personal and intimate way than you've ever known before. Jesus said when he, the Spirit of Truth, is come, that Holy Spirit, he shall glorify me. When I commit myself to the revelation made in the New Testament, I receive from God the gift of the Holy Spirit who begins to be what Jesus did, what Jesus is, how Jesus lives, and puts Jesus in me. And he does in me subjectively all that Jesus Christ did for me objectively. There is no spirit without there being it being the presence of Jesus himself. There is no spirit of God and presence of spirit and presence of fire and this and that and the other thing that people desire right now to have these manifestations of gifts of the spirit and doing all these wonderful works and all these miraculous things without there being the person of Jesus Christ standing in the midst of it. For when they speak of the spirit and they speak of the power and they speak of this and the presence and all these other things, they deny Jesus Christ himself. For it is not of the Spirit that the Spirit would speak. For it is not the Holy Spirit that they participate with. For God himself said that the Spirit of God would not speak of himself, but he would reveal, he would show, he would Remind, he would teach, and he would convict of the words that Jesus said. What does it cost to be a Christian today? 
Is it just a matter of saying some simple prayer? Oh, by grace we are saved. Just ask and you will receive. Just seek and you will find. Just knock and the door will be open. Oh, but my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is that all it costs to be a Christian? But Lord, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not raised the dead, healed the sick, and done all these works in your name? What does it cost to be a Christian today? A fancy concert? A slick presentation? A quick message that appeals to the soul but does nothing for the spirit? I don't know what it costs to be a Christian for you. I have no idea. I only know those that I grew up with. I only know those saints and martyrs that I've seen in the half marks of faith. The men that have come before me. Whether they be written in the scriptures or whether they be written in the book of Acts or in the historical records or whether they be Roman Catholic. Greek, Protestant, Pilgrim, Fundamentalist, Pentecostal, or Jesus Freak or Muslim. I only know that the men that have come before me that have my ear, it cost them their life. And they were willing to lay down their life pick up Jesus and let him live through them. Today, I don't know what it costs you, but it costs me my time, my energy, my words, my life, my loves, my desires, my hopes, my dreams, my cares. My being, my finances, my wealth, my health, <laughs> what wealth, health. It costs me everything. What does following Jesus mean to you? And what does Christianity cost? The question will determine your eternal destiny. But the answer will be your salvation. <laughs>